I think we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another edition of um, the Anthony Peake Consciousness Hour in Con. These are now becoming really popular, and lots of people are listening into them, um, which is really great, and people are listening across the world, which is even better. Today, um, it's going to be a two-hander between myself and um, my wonderful um, assistant co-presenter, Sarah Janes. And our intention today is to have the kind of conversations that we normally have when we have a cup of coffee together and a group of us get together and we just let the conversation go where it flows. Um, some of you will have known of Sarah because um, Sarah was an earlier guest on the Anthony Peake Consciousness Now. So most of the background information, if you want to know more about Sarah the human being and Sarah the person, you'll find it all there. Um, we're intending today to discuss, basically, we're going to be focusing in on Greece, um, Grecian culture, Egyptian culture, and various other areas. But as with these conversations, we probably will end up anywhere and probably will end up talking about Iceland and uh, the Cod Wars, but we shall see. Now, the interesting thing was that um, Sarah posted something um, about an hour ago regarding the fact that she had um, an extraordinary, well, Sarah always has extraordinary dreams, I think, but she had an extraordinary series of dreams recently. And I think they're the perfect way of moving forward in terms of the conversation. So, Sarah, if you can tell us a little bit about these dreams and uh, what they mean or what they augur. <laughs> well, last night, my dream was about you, Anthony, which I'm sure you get all the time. Uh <laughs> I, I was dreaming, dreaming about me. Yeah, well, I'm sure you get messages from your fans saying that they're dreaming about you all the time, don't you? I do, yeah. I do <laughs> uh, well, in my dream, we were touring Greece, and obviously I knew this was coming up, and we talk about Greece and Crete and our Plato's Cave thing all the time. And um, last night I dreamt that me, you, and Samantha were touring um, the best sites in Greece to conduct our Plato's Cave experiment. And we found, we ended up finding this place and it was, it took place in a post COVID world as well. And there was this real sense of, um, there were, there was this kind of split between people that just wanted to go back to the the way life was before people that were going to nightclubs, wearing face masks and doing their normal jobs and still trying to hold on to that idea of, of life pre-COVID and then there were this kind of new idea that we needed to create a new world and a new life and me you and Samantha obviously were part of that that idea so we ended up finding this uh guest house in Crete that was run run by this really ancient lady who had run like a and b before COVID uh, and she hadn't had any guests since, but every guest that had stayed there before had left a, a book and she was like renting them out as a library or selling them. And that's how she was making money. And um, she then, there was a weird little bit in it where she was telling me about uh, this kind of scam that was started by early people in Crete, whereby they were making these little um, votive hands where the fingers were separated and you had to put a coin in between the two fingers and they were embedded in walls with like collection pots behind them and you had to put a coin in and it would grant your wish and then you had to turn it and that would activate your wish and make it come true. That was the end of it. But I think it was, uh, the it seemed to be like the third in a series of dreams, like a triptych of dreams. And the first one was, I went to this theme park called Sedge World, which was inspired by ancient Egypt. And uh, basically everything was made out of mud. And as you thought about what it was and the form kind of started to take shape and things started to manifest into uh, actual attractions and real things. And then um, the next dream after that was about uh, recreating an ancient dream healing sanctuary, making beds out of earth and planting them with chamomile so that people could sleep and relax and commune with the earth goddess. Well, do you actually have precognitive or do you have these kind of dreams on a regular basis? Uh, you know, they, well, I guess they must be part of your life, I guess. Yeah, well, the, the one that I had about making the dream beds I kind of woke up from that just elated and inspired. And I did get this sense of receiving divine inspiration. And in the dream, it told me that I needed to um, make a garden for the Chelsea flower show so that I could expose to the world, the power of dream healing. And, uh, and it did get me thinking that because my research is about dream healing and dream medicine and the Asclepians in ancient Greece, that actually the primary objective of dreaming in terms of uh, sacred practice is actually about receiving this inspiration from the gods 
and that that's the potency and the power of that dreaming does have and that healing is almost like a side effect of that kind of encounter with a deity wow that is very intriguing i'm um, particularly rem reminded me here because you know when i was doing my research uh, over recent years into the minoan civilization and in fact arthur evans and why arthur evans decided to do the excavations uh, which eventually discovered knossos one of the things that um he was aware that there was something around that area were things called galopetras which are kind of milkstones that um, the local people in the area in 1900 or 1895, whenever he first went down to Iraklian, these things were, were being worn by people. And clearly these were things that actually had writing. They had linear A and linear B written mm -hmm. on them, but the locals were using them as, as um, amulets kind of thing. So it was quite intriguing you were talking about amulets there because, you know, this was only something I've been re thinking about recently. Um, in terms of your, your work, it's something that I've always wanted to discuss with you, you know, with the golden opportunity now. When you talk about dream incubation, what do you actually mean? What are the processes you use to do that? Essentially setting an intention for receiving a particular dream. So you can do that by writing down the dream that you want, by thinking about the dream that you want, by invoking the gods that are going to deliver the dream that you want. For example, if you wanted healing, really contemplating what that means and how that may take place. So dream incubation is basically ritual sleep as far as I'm concerned. So you are going to sleep with a purpose, with an aim to receive something in the dream state. And have you found, I presume in your past, you found effective? Yeah, I've had a couple of dreams where I've had encounters with either dream healers or doctors and uh, with gods as well. With Ahura Mazda is the one that I remember the most vividly. Really? So the Zoroastrian, yeah. so the yeah. Zoroastrian god. Yeah, I so got how to did you Uhura Mazda for a while. So how did you know it was Uhura Mazda? Did Mazda, Mazda well, I was into Uhura, Uhura Mazda. It wasn't like a sort of spontaneous occurrence. I was getting quite into learning about Uhura Mazda. Okay. And uh, also I'm a sun worshipper. So I worship Uhura Mazda, Aten, the solar disc. And uh, so Uhura Mazda appeals to me on that basis and in the dream I was standing in my childhood home on the landing and Ahura Mazda descended from heaven and came towards me as a being of light and as I was infused with the light of Ahura Mazda I went into a kind of micro uh, vision of inside my body and I could see DNA spirals untwisting so they formed a ladder that Ahura Mazda as a light being could walk down and it was really great and my whole that's the thing that I love about lucid dreaming more than almost every other aspect of it is you get this bodily sensation of bliss and I really love that. How did you know it was Ahura Mazda? Mazda? It just looked like Ahura Mazda from the pictures. Ah, right. Okay. And I so suppose that's, that's the thing in dreaming. You get a sense of stuff that's like non-verbal. It's just like an int intuition. That's what I was wondering. That's why the point I was making was the idea that somehow intuitively you know, you know what this, this, this entity is that you're encountering because you just have this other form of knowing, mm. which suggests, doesn't it, that in the dream state you have a much broader and wider area of perception than you ordinarily would yeah so when you encounter when you encounter these entities do you believe them to be part of you emanations from your own subconscious or do you believe they have independence of you i don't know about independence i think they're kind of part of they're part of everything they're part of the collective unconscious whatever you want to call it the akashic field i was thinking um about what you were saying there I was talking to you the other day, actually, about um, uh, this idea that we can record dream speech and uh, that I've been talking to a researcher in California, Daniel Aldis, who works in sleep labs. And he's developed or trying to work on a project to record the micro movements of your voice box during dreaming that can record the words that you're saying when you're talking in a dream. So he's trying to record dream speech, essentially, because although most of your body is paralyzed when you're dreaming, your voice box and some other parts of your body, your eyes and your fingertips can make these micro movements. And so your voice box is making the micro movements of the speech. And if they can get good enough recordings of those movements through electromyography, they can 
type up what you're saying in your dreams, which would be quite scary, actually. But I contacted Daniel Aldis, more to your point here. I contacted Daniel Aldis because I had a dream about him. And um, I dreamt that he helped me make a film called A New Theory of Deep Sleep. And my my interest in dreaming when I was a kid was all about I wanted to make a um, a I wanted to make films basically that looked like my dreams because I was so inspired about it. and I was inspired by this idea of a machine that could record your dreams so other people could see them. And uh, in my in my dream with Daniel Aldis, I'd been reading about his research. I contacted him and I said I had this dream about this uh, film that was called A New Theory of Deep Sleep. And in it, I was sort of saying something similar to what you said there, that I think sometimes in the dream state, your, um, your perceptory capabilities seem to shift into um, like an entirely different system of perception, like a non-visual, the senses seem to merge and perhaps we go through a kind of synesthetic experience of a full body perception of reality yeah because that again is quite a fascinating idea the the way the ability to to record your verbalizations in a dream because i'm thinking how much am i verbal in my dreams because these are the things you never think about because i'm hopeless at um dreaming i enjoy dreaming and everything else but i've only ever had one lucid dream in, well i've had two now two lucid dreams in my life and both of which were profoundly amazing is the only term i can use when i first discovered because i knew about lucid dreaming because i'd researched it and written about it but it's when it first happens to you and i was in a i was in a nightclub um because years ago i spent an awful lot of time in nightclubs and things so it's nothing strange about that i'm in the nightclub and it seems that when you dream you're incredibly stupid you don't realize the strangeness of the things that are taking place around you because ordinarily you should immediately think i'm in a dream because that guy looks weird or something like that but it was when i walked out of the nightclub and i walked into an, an alleyway behind the back of the nightclub and i thought this is i just subliminally thought to myself this is incredibly real and then i thought but I'm lying in bed and I think there was a sudden sensation of the duvet over me that I realized I was actually dreaming. And then it was bang, completely lucid. And I thought, what can I do now? And I thought, well, maybe I can jump in the air. So I lifted my feet off the ground and I fell and I banged my knees on the floor. So I think that's peculiar. I should be able to fly now and I can't. And then I then said, well, maybe I'll put my arms out. And I found myself rising in the air. And then I flew over a wall at the back of the alleyway. And then there was the most amazing vista. And the thing is extraordinary about these dreams are they're almost like they're incredibly visually powerful. They're like charged dreams. You remember them forever. Even now I'm there. Well, as I describe they say that, that about lucidity, like you remember lucid dreams because your frontal cortex is activated and you have that ability to self-reflect and critical thinking you remember a lucid dream the same, same way you would remember your waking reality. Interesting. So because the frontal cortex is activated, because ordinarily would it be the occipital lobe or the temporal lobes, I suppose. Mm. So you, you're suddenly, your personality comes into it, don't they? And the sense of I, the ego yeah. comes in. And I'm flying along in the air and I can see traffic driving along. And to me, the only equivalent I could have is I've had a series in my life quite regularly of very, very powerful hypnagogic images that have occurred to me during the day. And the first time it happened was I was in the I was in the office at work. I, I used to be an executive at an airline and um, I was in the office at work and I'm sitting in front of the computer doing some work. And then suddenly I'm not. Suddenly I'm looking down at an elderly man reading a newspaper sitting down and I'm looking down at him and your mind's eye is pro trying to process what I'm seeing while I'm sitting in my office. Then I look up in the hypnagogic state and I, I can see a square. And again, I can see this, even this was 30 years ago, I can see a square and in the far corner of the square, there was an ambulance going around and I could hear the siren and the car stopping. And I knew it was somewhere in Latin America. I felt it was Buenos Aires or something. And then suddenly it all disappears, it evaporates. And you sit there and you go, I didn't create that. That spontaneously occurred in my sense sensorium in such a way. And it was 
tan tangibly real. And then a few weeks later, a similar thing happened. And this time, I'm looking up through a glass table at an elderly lady putting a cup of coffee down on the surface. And I'm looking up as if I'm a cat or something looking up through the surface. Now, again, most peculiar things, as if I was taking the consciousness in the first one of a bird or something looking down and the second one of a cat or something. So clearly, as you say, in these kind of states, our consciousness seems to broaden out into this greater something. Um, but you lucidly dream regularly. Can you tell us, a tell me a little bit about this? Because I'm intrigued to know from your point of view, how you trained yourself to do it and some, some experiences you had in that state. I think um, it happened by accident. Although actually talking to my mum and dad and my family, we all have good dreams. My mum and dad are always telling me about dreams they have. And I come from like a really normal working class family in Croydon. And uh, dreams is sort of the only weird type of conversation that they engage in. But yeah, my mum and dad will always tell me about their weird dreams. So maybe it's genetic. But I think one element is a very sort of practical element of um, when I was a kid, my dad made me a cabin bed. I mean, I, I do remember dreams where I think I must have been a toddler where um, I had dreams that basically occurred in this totally white room. And then I, I made the reasoning that as I grew up and had more experiences, that room filled up. And then I started to dream about different places and landscapes. And I remember one of the earliest dreams I ever had, and I must have been really young, was uh, being a child of the 80s. I dreamt that my Fisher Price phone was ringing, the little toy Fisher Price phone, and I answered it, and it was Wurzel Gummidge, and he said, "I've just killed your nan." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was the first dream. That was, I remember the dreams that were just white boxes, and then that was the first dream where I remember stuff and things and like ideas and concepts being in it. And totally then weird. That's, that's that's totally weird, isn't it? Wurzel Gummidge killing your nan. Wurzel Gummidge <laughs> was terrifying, though. To be fair. I guess so. But I, I never had him down as a murderer, I have to say. But I especially <laughs> even, at that, even at that young age. <laughs> it's coming from Croydon. I mean, Croydon yeah, does that it too. It might be age. that, yeah. Um, so I remember dreaming a lot about toys as well, which makes me think I was young because I dreamt about receiving dream toys and uh, particular things that I had my eye on, stuff out of the Argos catalogue, that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I think the reason why I, I then started to have like really epic lucid dreams, um, I don't know how old, old I would have been, but my dad built me a cabin bed. And I think that's when they started to become really epic and lucid, like all lucid. I don't know when I was really young, I'm not sure how lucid they were, but I, I really, really remember that Wurzel Gummidge phone dream. So potentially that could have been lucid. But yeah, my dad built me this cabin bed out of MDF and uh, or whatever. I don't know, is MDF in the 80s? Whatever that was. It, he's kind of made it and it didn't have a ladder and it didn't also have the thing that stopped you from falling out of your bed. So um, I think I was scared of falling out of my bed. So I just used to lie on my back and try not to move all night. And that is probably what made me have really good lucid dreams. I reckon. Yeah, and then also, because it would have been like a bit of a ball leg to get out of bed to go to the toilet. I think a lot of children start having lucid dreams because they realise they need to go for a wee in the middle of the night and they wake up so they don't wet themselves. And so I would become aware of needing to go for a wee and, and try to like eke it out as long as possible because I was too lazy to get out of bed to because I'd have to climb onto my desk and then climb all the way out of my bed. So it was quite a, a big job. Because that's an interesting point, isn't it? That you can become lucid because you're in a, a situation that is, is, is in effect threatening in some way or, or quasi perceived to be quasi dangerous. So presumably part of your subconscious remains, awake, some part of your consciousness remains vigilant and awake. I think there's an element of uh, like requiring alertness. I definitely felt mm. that I required alertness in my bed. <laughs> Yeah, because that could have been quite terrifying, just rolling over. I also did a thing where I used to pretend there was a little cupboard um, next to my bed uh, on my wall. There were loads of little weird things that I did, though, because I, I really remember that bed and what it felt like. I had this wallpaper that had this um, sort of graphic print of flowers, 
And if I went cross-eyed <laughs> and looked at it, I could see the flowers standing about this far away from the wallpaper. Like I, it was like a little visual trick that I could do at will. And I would get my hand and I would want my hand to go through the kind of etheric layer of flowers, if you see what I mean. Like I'd separated mm. the two planes. And as soon as I reached what looked like a kind of etheric layer of flowers, the two surfaces would like zoom together. And I used to do that for ages. I must have been really bored. And then also my dad had uh, used a palette knife to make a swirly pattern on my ceiling. And um, I think he'd got a bit drunk as he was doing it. And it got like increasingly psychedelic and swirly. And um, it had like pinpricks of where the paint was... Um, uh, like dripping down and I used to look at that and sometimes it would look like the drips were sucking up and sometimes it would look like the drips were sucking down I used to like flip between the two um, perceptions of it and I think that we've spoken about this before there's uh, perhaps a sort of more of a development in terms of how you use your eyes these days to look at surfaces and flat surfaces and not look into and through space we're so kind of glued to screens that perhaps we've lost that ability for um, the kind of soft gaze that's required for looking into something like an obsidian mirror for example and I, I sometimes give the the uh, example of a um, what's the name of it one of those magic eye pictures where you have to soften your gaze to look through the image to make that image appear to you. Mm, I've never been able to to, to to do those um, uh, images ever. It's going to be quite frustrating. Everybody's saying you must be able to see it and you can't. And I think when they first came out in the 1970s, I think like late 1970s, you know, it, it intrigued me as to why it is that certain people, and that's when you start to realise that vision is a very intensely personal thing as well. You know, mm. what you see is not necessarily what is out there. I mean, obviously to there's not one to one relationship, but, but clearly how we perceive is different. And, you know, the point you were making before there about almost a sense of synesthesia when you're in um, a dream state whereby you can actually sense everything around you. Uh, and of course, this is going to be very interesting in a future discussion, isn't it? When um, if we get um, our Australian friend to join us in terms of her experiences having superior autobiographical memory, which could be quite intriguing is to find out whether there's a link there with synesthesia. But did you ever at any time during your childhood, did you did you move out of the dream world into consensual reality? Did you actually ever have any out of the body experiences while you're in these states? Or was it always in the dream state that you, you were, you were pretty much, Yeah, pretty much always in the dream state. I had uh, a lot and loads and loads of false awakenings, I remember as a child. Like, I think oh, a lot. Tell me more about do. that. They, they fascinate me. I think that that was to do with my, um, potentially to do with my, uh, my cap, cabin bed type situation as well, because I didn't want to get out of bed. Uh, and I had to go to school and I remember like thinking I'd waken up over and over and over again, sometimes be like 10, 15 times. Um, I think that's really common for kids. And I think lucid dreaming often starts for kids because of things like that, because of needing to go to the toilet in the middle of the night. And actually also because of nightmares, kids learn how to become lucid because at some point they recognize that the scary night creature is not real and they either fight it or decide to wake up. And um uh, that's how a lot of people would get into lucid dreaming because of nightmares. That's, that's, it's intriguing, isn't it? Because one of the, in my, my latest book, I have a section on um, quasi-corporal companions, the, the Halliwell principle of the kind of entities that young children seem to perceive. Um, and I had posited in that, that it's to do possibly with the myelination of the neurons or possibly the development of the corpus callosum. But interestingly enough, um, I've been swapping a series of email messages um, with uh, a, a, a Canadian professor of psychology um, who had been a previous guest here, um, um, Imra, Imrat Barouche. And he's pointing out to me that the latest research is very much suggesting that I've misunderstood the, the nature of myelination 
in terms of the neurons, which is excellent. This is really good that I'm now in a position that people who really know are reading my work and coming back in a nice way and saying, no, you've misunderstood this, but we wouldn't expect you to understand it because you're not a neurologist and you're not an academic. Therefore, you don't have the opportunity to be pointed in the right direction for these things. So clearly there's something else happening here. And then I'm reminded of, um, I, I received a few years ago, a fascinating email from a, um, a Facebook friend of mine called Ash Gabadon. And Ash described to me a whole series of false awakenings he'd had quite recently to the time he contacted me. And it was quite curious because he said, you know, he woke up, got up, went to the loo, cleaned his teeth, and then he was back in bed again. Then he woke up, cleaned his teeth, went to the loo, went downstairs, had breakfast and woke up again. And it happened to him eight times. And in the end, he'd got to the late afternoon of the day in question. And he, the only reason he became aware was he looked out the window and it was dark and he thought that's peculiar. It shouldn't be dark. And he comes to again. And he then asked the incredibly pertinent question of me, which of course, there's no real answer to it. How does he know that the last awakening was an awakening either? Could this be con a continuation of his dream state? Because how would we ever know? How can you ever know of the, these kind of circumstances? So, Let's talk a little bit more about this, this, this whole concept, really, of the ancient Greek cultures and the way the Asclepion and everything else and the way that they, they worked with dreams. And indeed, the ancient Egyptians, if you prefer to start with the ancient Egyptians, it's even better, you know. So you just tell us a little bit about how these ancient cultures worked with dreams and why their concept of dreams were different to our own. I think there's um, a lot of stuff that's missing from the record in terms of uh dreaming used for divinatory purposes and also contact with the gods and one of my ideas about uh dreaming is that actually dreaming was fundamental and essential to the development of culture and the more ideas we created in reality we created this feedback system with personal dreaming that could for example make avatars and dream characters out of gods or figurines, sculptures, votive offerings, and that dreaming contributed to the increase in complexity of culture and our ideas about reality. And especially once we're able to write down things, I think there's a, there's a possibility also that our consciousness has evolved. We've spoken a lot about Julian James, but that our consciousness has evolved so that I think in particular our memory functionality is different in contemporary humans and that perhaps ancient people had a more integrated kind of memory and perhaps something more closely associated with a synesthetic experience of reality, that perhaps their senses weren't as divided as ours have become through the advent of cultural things like writing and tool making and things like that. Yeah, because that's interesting, isn't it? The, the idea that as soon as we start to write down our ideas, we kind of divest of them and they become permanent on a piece of paper, which can or whatever, which can then be communicated with other human beings. But when you've got something where you can't keep the communication in some way, you have to hold it. And you, you're in a much more verbally orientated, tail orientated society. And of course, dreaming itself is, is a curious thing, isn't it? We, we, we suspect that dogs dream and we suspect that other animals dream because we can measure dreaming, we can see them enacting things. So what is the role of dreaming really? Because it seems to be something of a waste of energy. If the brain needs energy in order to communicate, to, to work, it's using the energy up unnecessarily because surely it should be much more used in waking life to, in order to help us survive. So there must be some kind of survival mechanism with dreaming. And I think your point that it's somehow where um, earlier civilizations could use it as a model for testing out environments almost. Yeah, I think that maybe dreaming is a is creating personality. And I had that I have that experience of remembering dreams from being very young that you feel like your personality, your sort of psyche is formed in the dream state. Like babies spent spend an enormous amount of time in REM sleep because they're mm. processing and forming their psychic landscape, I think. And your personality develops 
through dreaming, your sense of self develops through dreaming. And, you know, you see it with people that don't remember a lot of dreams that there are emotional issues involved often in people that are suppressing dreaming. Like, for example, if people take um, antidepressants, you suppress REM sleep. If you um, smoke a lot of cannabis, you pr- you generally um, suppress REM sleep. And then you can kind of end up stuck in an emotional rut because you aren't dreaming to process and to grow um, within your, you know, your personality. A lot of people tell me that they smoke weed so that they don't dream because their dreams are disturbing. And so if you aren't ever resolving um, emotional issues in your dream states, then you, you, you tend not to be able to grow and develop as a person. So how does cannabis do that? Is what, What's the neurological background there? Because I, I'd assume that, you know, cannabis, because of its its nature, would facilitate dreaming rather than suppress it. That's quite interesting. It, it can promote um, deep sleep and the same as uh, antidepressants do as well. And often people that smoke cannabis, you get this like kickback effect when you give it up that you have like incredibly like overwhelming dreams. People say they wake up feeling exhausted. But this is why I think the idea of antidepressants is they're only supposed to be used short term because if you are suffering a lot from anxiety and depression, sleeping can be something that can exacerbate the problem. If you can't get a good night's rest, then you're going to end up even more anxious and even more stressed and depressed the next day. So being able to have good quality deep sleep is really useful, but it would be better to take them short term so you don't end up suppressing REM sleep. But I mean, it's interesting to think that so many people have unresolved issues that only surface in their dreams and they aren't consciously aware of the issues that are going on and, and they're perplexed by why stuff happens in their dreams even. Because that again shows really bicamerality, doesn't it, in terms of conscious awareness, to again use a Jamesian term, that we interpret our dreams in a different way and a different part of the brain is active in such a way that it's it's, it's almost pushing itself onto, onto us saying, look, you know, these are the things you need to pay attention to, but you're, you're sublimating them. Whereas in the dreams, you can't. I mean, it's it's very Freudian in terms of that kind of analysis, but it does seem that we do. Whereas in dreams, that control mechanism is gone, isn't it? Suddenly the, or, or even more Jungian, I suppose, that, you know, the, the, the elements of the shadow start to come out and the elements of the, the various components of the personality come out. And it forces us to face these things up front. And it's when we wake up and we feel disturbed because funny enough, recently, and it's only very recently, in the last two weeks, I'm having more and more work, work-related work dreams. Now, many people will not be aware, but ordinarily I earn my living as a, a management consultant and go into companies, parachute into companies and sort issues out or do analysis work for them and that kind of thing. And one of the major problems of being a management consultant is that you're always being parachuted in with only half the information. So you have to start in a role. You don't know the politics. You don't understand the nuances. You don't understand the history. You have your professional expertise, but that's it. And that's the only thing you can hide behind. Um, And I'm finding now that my dreams are consistently, I'm discovering information. I've already made the decisions, already done my presentation to the board and everything else. So this is what you need to do. And then suddenly more information is given to me. And I suddenly realize that everything I've presented isn't right. And I go into this panic and I wake up in a cold sweat. And I I did it last night. You know, I woke up and I realized that everything I've been working on hadn't worked. And I'm wondering why is this happening now? Because technically I'm now an old age pensioner, so I'm now retired. So therefore I don't have that pressure anymore, but my mind still needs it. My mind still needs that, that tension almost. Because I could sit back and because, you know, I've got a new book to write and that's tense, that's stressful, but it's in a different way. And it's as if you have these things that are underneath. It's like there's a, 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 a you know, it's not a unique analogy, but it's like a very deep waters. And there are these things lurking underneath that go right back to your childhood almost. There's so many people. Like your legs. Yeah, there's so many people that say they have dreams about um, school to me which I don't really think about school very often, but for a lot of people, it was a very traumatic time in their life, a very stressful time in their life. And I think often you use those kind of archetypal type of experiences, the ones that had the deepest impact and that have the most vivid memory for you to represent issues that are going on in your life now, because they're the go-to familiar scenery that expresses 
just a sense or a feeling and it doesn't relate necessarily to that time but it expresses perfectly feelings of anxiety or insecurity or not being good enough stuff like that the school things often about not feeling good enough about being humiliated or exposed in some way so it's I find it interesting how many people will still have dreams about being at school and then also I find it very interesting where people dream about a lot of people dream about their childhood home and I think this has to do with uh, the way your memory and the way your brain works as a child is uh, everything that you absorb is is brought into your consciousness with equal value and then as you go through puberty your neuronal pathways are pruned back so that you can concentrate on particular areas but I would I would do these exercises because I think memory is so vital this is why I want to talk to Rebecca Sharrock who has a highly Mm. superior autobiographical memory like we're talking about because the way she remembers her dreams is just like every single day can remember everything that happens she's always lucid because her memory is so incredible that she doesn't ever forget that she's who she is. And um, I find that element of it the most fascinating element of that condition because it's a completely different experience of reality. But um, I would do these experiments in order to um, have lucid dreams of remembering details from my childhood because you recognise when you start doing that, that you remember things from your childhood in such a incredible detail that you wouldn't remember things from nowadays just because that's the way your brain worked then and it's still kind of kept as it was so you remember things like what the top of the taps looked like in your childhood Mm. bathroom or the kitchen cupboards or kitchen appliances or the hall you know and, and I'll do this journey from being outside my childhood home walking off the road through the gate and even now I can just see every single detail of it the carvings in our number plaque on the wall Uh, what our garden looked like, the texture of the steps leading up to the front door. And if you take yourself on that visual journey, you realise that these memories are all there. You know, these memories are really um, hardwired into your Mm. consciousness. I mean, it's one of the themes in my book, The Labyrinth of Time. I was particularly interested with both time and memory. And it's a central part of my overall hypothesis is that we don't actually forget anything, that it, it is all, always in there. And it's just that we can't necessarily access it. But there were sometimes um, experiences that I've recorded. I mean, one of the experiences that I found was most peculiar uh, took place a few years ago. And it's to do with memory as well. And it's to do with people getting older, because as people get older, the, 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 the memories of childhood seem to bubble out. You know, you get older and suddenly these things become more real. And elderly people tell you all the time, I'm remembering my childhood now. And again, um, in uh, Oliver Sacks's book, A Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, um, the psychiatrist Oliver Sacks, there is one chapter called A Passage to India. And in A Passage to India, Oliver Sacks describes a young woman or a, a, a woman in her 20s who's dying. She's got an astro, astrocyco, astrocytoma, I think it is, in the brain or some kind of growth in her brain. And she's dying of it. And as she progresses into getting closer to death, she spends more and more time in these reverie states. And she describes to um, to Sachs how she's actually living being a child again. You know, she's literally back there again, living it. And this reality is ceasing to be because the childhood memories are taking over completely. And it reminded me of a very peculiar event that took place a few years ago when my mother was sinking into Alzheimer's before she became non-communicative. And it was the last time she really communicated with me. And it was weird. I get a phone call here from the home and they said, your mother is is really kicking off. She's she, she We can't control her. You're going to have to speak to her. So... I picked up that they put the gave my mother the phone and my mother goes, Oh, thank God, Tony, it's you. She said, these people have captured me. She said, I'm not having it. I'm going to sue them. I'm going to sue them. They've captured me. And I said, mum, how have they captured you? And she said, well, I was watching, I was sitting in, a, in the living room, watching Morecambe and Wise with your father. And now my father had died 20 years, 25 years before. And she said, and we're sitting there watching Morecambe Wise, and I just go into 40 winks, and I wake up, and I'm in this place. And I said, no, mum, you're in a home. And she said, no, I'm not. I'm at home. And I said, mum, mum, you're, you're in your early 90s. And she said, no, I'm not. And then she went, who are you again? You're my son. And I said, yes. And she goes, you sound much older. 
My son's at university, isn't he? He's early 20s. You're not my son. You're, you're, you're in cahoots with them. I'm going to sue you as well. And she slammed the phone down. I rang back and then I spoke to her again and she was slightly more stable. And I said, mum, mum, no, you're 90. She said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And I said, look at your hands. And she looked at her hands and she went, oh, my God. And it was it was almost like from the heart. It was, oh, my God, the realisation that she was in an old person's body. And then she she went she she went off on one again and they had to then calm her down and everything else. And then soon after that, she just became catatonic. Now, what was happening there? It was as almost as if you imagine your worst nightmare that you're, you're a woman in your early 40s or whatever. And you just 40 winks and you're an old person. And does it mean that our life is, as I say in my books, it's the linger surreal, it's the long body. And we can flick from one location to others. And in the dream world, we can move around in there. And as a final point, and I don't, and this is a point I'd like to, to, to chat with you about, is that on at least three occasions in my life, I've had life dreams. Dreams that I've lived a whole life as a completely different person. I've had a wife, I've had children. I've had a career. And then you wake up and you have this incredible sense of loss. And I'm reminded here for my new books, I'm, I'm researching very seriously my new book. And there was a particular episode of Star Trek. Oh, my God. The Inner Light. My favorite yes. episode ever. I'm just I've literally. Wow. That's freaky. <laughs> she was just, I was she just, was just say, It's the inner light. I love it. <laughs> whoa, sh you know what? So <laughs> shivers just shivers literally just gone up my spine because I just wrote the section on the inner light this morning for my new book. OK, you explain the inner light because it, it is next most. It is apparently voted oh, as being brilliant. the best Star Trek episode ever. I was just going to say that that's one of the things when I was a kid, when I wanted to be a dream film director, my my experience of lucidity led me to believe that uh, in the dream state, you transcend time and therefore you could transcend death if you could master lucidity and be lucid all the time. So the inner light is the best episode of uh, the next generation Star Trek and Picard is probed by an alien vessel. And while he's probed, he suddenly falls into an altered state of consciousness in which he lives his whole life out, gets married, has kids, leaves his shoes outdoors and, uh, uh, dies an old man and then he comes round and he's just five seconds away from being probed and it's hot oh and he learns how to play the flute in that time oh, it's well. the flute scenes isn't it the flute scenes that <laughs> so oh, it's at least he's left with that so he can always play the flute after that but it is the best episode of next generation for sure because I wonder whether these 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 tropes and in the new book I'm going to be discussing these I'm going to have a lot about uh, popular culture and the tropes in popular culture these things seem to be part of the Weltgeist and the Zeitgeist. They are things that we subliminally know are right. We subliminally relate to films like that in such a visceral way because it's got you nodding, going, yeah, yeah, that's how it is. And as you know, my concept of cheating the ferryman, that's exactly what I say, is that, you know, we are all our lives. And again, I'm reminded of the J.B. Priestley play um, Time in the Conways, Act two, where one of the characters, Alan, makes a speech about we are all of our lives. We are like slices and each part of our life. But we are a young person. We are an old person. And again, when we did the interview with 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 Ed Gilchrist, you know, one of the things that Ed and I had discussed about his son was that his son is somehow outside of the linear time as if it's a, our life is a train and it's traveling from the from the past into the future, from the future into the past. And you're, we're normally in the carriage, looking out the window, out the carriage, but somebody who has a temporal lobe epilepsy or schizophrenia or even migraine or autism sometimes even, they're sitting on the top of the train and they can see in front of themselves and they can see behind themselves and they can flick between these locations, which is what we do in dreams. Yeah, I have this sense in dreams often where uh, I get an experience of feeling like I can remember everything. And it's over, an overwhelming feeling of, I would, I would align it with the sensation of deja vu, but it's, it's mm. deeper and different to that. It's like you could remember all of your past lives, all of everything, but it's such a 
a flood of information that you can't really pinpoint exactly what it is. It's like the sensation of having something on the tip of your tongue or deja vu where you feel like you've got access to everything, but there's so much that you can't focus in on any particular detail of it. Yeah, Morris Book called it the oceanic feeling. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of what uh, Peter Rospensky wrote when he was um, traveling on the Sea of Azov in Russia. And, you know, just for a split second, he got that sensation of oneness with everything and knowing everything. And again, it's something, isn't it, that the, the metaphysical poets tried to write about. And in later times, people like Wordsworth in, you know, that wonderful line in um, lines written a few miles above Tintin Abbey. You know, I've seen something within the, within the light of setting suns. And we all have that sensation. And you and I are both Grecophiles. And the one country I get that so often is Greece. And I had a time slip, a genuine time slip that took place in Greece in 1984. Well, it wasn't Greece, actually. It was, it was, it was the part of Turkey that had been part of Greece. And we'd been traveling around the whole of Turkey and we were traveling back along the Lycian coast, um, the Mediterranean coast of Turkey on the underbit, which used to be at the Greek place of Lycia. And we traveled through Lycia and then we moved further up and there was a place called Militas, which is this amazing city, uh, ancient Greek city there. And in those days, in 1984, these places were open access. So you didn't have to pay. You just went in and you wandered around. And I went there and I had this really strange feeling. I, I, I can't describe it. The air was heavy around me. And I didn't want to be with the rest of the group. So I left my then girlfriend, Jenny, and I walked away from everybody else. And I sat on the roof of a, a, an old, old mosque that was in the grounds of the, the, the ancient city. And I sat there and I looked out over the Menderus River. Now, the Menderus River is this big, Menderus River is a huge river that runs into the, the Mediterranean or into the Aegean, I should say. And I'm sitting there and I'm looking along the Menderus Valley and I see the, mount, the mountains opposite. And there's a, a hill, a hillock in the distance. And suddenly the earth shimmered. And suddenly the, the, the valley was an, it was like a rear. It was like an inland sea. It, the, the water had filled up the valley. And the, what I thought was a hillock was an offshore island. And I'm sitting there thinking, this is extraordinary. And then I saw a Tyremi come out the side round the island. And the, again, the shiver down the spine and it shimmered and it went. Now, what is particularly strange about this is Arnold Ton Toynbee, the historian, had a similar experience in almost the same location many years ago. But on top of that, about six months later, I was reading an article in the Sunday Times, travel pages of the Sunday Times, and this writer describes an experience he had when he had a time slip at Militus. So clearly there are these kind of places where time just changes in some way that you can attune into another awareness. And is it like, like Philip K. Dick said, that we have orthogonal time, time that is at a right angle to this time, and everything is a permanent present, but we can't compartmentalize time by our mental processes. And when we go into altered states of consciousness or when we touch the new, the noetic, we, we suddenly feel something different. And is this how dreams work? You know, that suddenly we go into this other place that ordinarily were denied in some way. Have you ever had experiences like that? Because I know you're incredibly well-traveled and you're interested in ancient Egypt, which segues perfectly into that. Mm -hmm. But have you had anything similar like that? Um, I've had a lot of experiences of having that sense of timelessness, either in, pla in incredible places where I feel like I'm in a dream whilst I'm there, or, oh, that's my parcel. Can you um, uh, hold yeah, okay, I'll keep five talking. seconds? Yes, we had planned for this, folks. This is um, Sarah's parcel. And we actually said it was high. Do you know, do you know, I say actually an awful lot. One of the things that I find really irritating when I'm watching videos of myself, because you may know that I've um, earlier today put up a, a video of an interview I did with um, the, the actress Margie Clark. And I'm not as bad at that one of saying actually, but on, on some of the other ones, I say actually all the time. And it's like somebody scraping a piece of chalk down a, um, a blackboard. 
And every time I do it, I cringe like mad. So I'm thinking of ways of doing this. And I'm thinking maybe somebody could stick pins in my fingers every time I say actually, in which case it will stop me doing it. You know, <laughs> we all have these verbal tics. But we, we were just saying then that it will guarantee with certitude that your parcel will arrive while we're doing the interview. And as it is, it was exactly what happened. So anyway, <laughs> going back again to, to, to what you were saying. Yeah, I think most of my experiences, I have to say, of that timelessness experience, of oneness with the universe, are dream-based. And I think that the transcendence of time is really the essential element in it, because once you do transcend time, and time is a kind of concept, and can only be effective within certain spheres of influence... You know, if you think about where time comes from in terms of our planet, we're kind of uh, on solar time. But then beyond the Milky Way, beyond everywhere else, time doesn't really function in the same kind of way. And so where are we in that mix? So I think that time, there are sort of spheres of influence, cycles within cycles of different times. We've got the circadian rhythms of our biological clock and our, our cycles of sleep and um, uh, wakefulness. And then we've got time according to rotations of the earth and move cosmic movement. But beyond that, there's something even more, which we kind of know about is scientific. So I just think if we can, tr if we do access somehow uh, the state of timelessness, then reality as we know it can't really exist. Mm. Well, the Saint August, and I did this when I, when I wrote The Labyrinth of Time. I spent a year writing that book. And at the start of it, I was trying to understand the philosophy, the science and everything of time. And I was reminded of St. Augustine's famous statement that when I don't think about it, I understand time perfectly. But as soon as I start to think in any shape or form about exactly what time is, it confuses me. And after 380 pages of that book, I still didn't understand what I actually, what we actually see what we mean by time what what it, what it is in its intensity we can say scientifically and of course we can we can turn around and say you know it's um the second law of thermodynamics it's you know it's entropy it's it's it's, it's movement from order to disorder but that doesn't work that is a physical process time is not physical in that sense and yet we know from einsteinian physics that time and space are the same thing and that space becomes time and time becomes space and space expands depending upon your speed. And then you think, well, how can that be? How can something that is not physical? Because, of course, space is non-physical either, isn't it? You know, as Ernest Mack argued, you know, if there was no objects in space, what would space be? But if there were not objects in time, where does time go as well? You know, and it I seems that... that this is one of the key aspects that has uh, contributed towards our evolution of consciousness is our conception as a species of time, because ancient people viewed time as sun rising, sun setting, and had a much greater sense of the ancestors and a cyclical, natural view of time. And then modern humans have generally looked at time as this linear straight line. Mm. They don't generally... Um, do much ancestor worship. They don't really think often about cycles and seasons. They don't necessarily even view the sunrises and the sunsets. And then your sense of time is very different. And uh, other things dictate how you mark time, as in your alarm clock goes off, or you have to go to school, you have to go to work. And um, it's probably better to have the natural cyclical type of time system in terms of feeling like you belong to this planet and this nature that exists on the planet? That's a very good point because um, there is a school of um, his history that's very much French uh, called Lani. And Lani was formed by a guy called Marc Bloch. Um, he wrote a wonderful book called Feudal Society in the 1930s. And when I read that book, it was one of the one of those kind of light in your head moments when he turns around and he says, in order to understand feudal society, you have to understand that these people, as you say, lived in this kind of timeless world where the, the, you, you, it was the cycles of the sun and everything else. And when it went dark, it went dark and you went to sleep. 
And of course, when you're in those circumstances, you're much closer to nature because we live in boxes, don't we? We drive around in cars, we live in houses, but all we ever need is one night under the stars in a forest where you're touching the ground, you know, and as, as our mutual friend Kaz Coronel was saying a few months ago to me, you know, that she was spending time walking around with no shoes and socks on, feeling the tactile feel of the ground underneath our feet. We don't even feel that. We kind of isolate ourselves from it. And you wonder then, you know, when you're in those circumstances, when you're closer to nature, suddenly the whole, your perceptual field changes and suddenly the, the visceral reality around us becomes far more immediate. I think the only movie that ever really got this, and I thought incredibly powerful, um, was, uh, oh, what was the one with the, 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 the people go up in, in uh, Tennessee or somewhere and they go into the hills and it's a found camera. Um, the, oh, oh dear. Not the Blair Witch really. Project. Blair Witch Project, <laughs> correct. The Blair Witch Project to me really got that idea across of visceral fear. You know, the idea of being lost in this quasi-hostile environment that we well, it's, never... interesting. it's interesting what you're saying about isolating ourselves from nature and I think that's the thing if you plug yourself into nature you observe nature you are of nature and therefore you have an intuitive sense for nature and what human beings have done systematically is distance themselves from nature by invent things that separate us from nature like even writing expressing and communicating in abstract terms I was thinking a lot because I am really really drawn to hieroglyphic writing systems and there's something about the hieroglyphic writing system that is inherently different to an abstract uh, cursive alphabetic based language whereby it's almost like the concept of the Akashic field made tangible because when you have a hieroglyphic writing system the hieroglyphs work by engaging your perceptual and your thinking abilities in a way that's so different to a normal alphabet that produces just sounds and not concepts because each sign has symbolic significance, meaning, is multi-layered. And so you just think in this multi-dimensional way when you work with the hieroglyphic scripts because they encourage this kind of full brain perception of reality and I think that as we started to use traditional alphabets that that way of thinking diminished the hieroglyphic writing systems were purer in a way they were like more expressive of uh, reality and uh, experience. I remember you enthralling me when you were describing uh, last summer when when we met up with you and you'd just been to the uh, British Museum about hieroglyphs and how they work. A lot of people don't know about, well, they know about them, they know the term and they know roughly what they look like. But you've invested a great deal of time, haven't you, in, in learning how to read them and everything else. Are there any interesting snippets of information that the guys out there would be interested in in terms of hieroglyphs and how they work? Because I thought they were just completely symbolic. You know, they're rather like Chinese pictograms where they literally, but they, they have sounds as well, don't they? They're more complex than that. Yeah, well, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, they are, they have like multiple multiple expressions I suppose so generally speaking in a in a in a section of hieroglyphs you would have um hieroglyphs that have a phonetic value so they'll spell out a word but even within the those phonetic values there are symbolic meanings of those symbols that kind of deepen the experience of that word for me anyway so you have things like um for example one of my favorite hieroglyphs is the hieroglyph for uh, ib heart and that is represented by kind of a heart but also the heart looks a bit like a jug and one of the words for drunkenness in ancient Egypt refers to the heart and it's this idea of um, an overflowing a brimming up of feeling in your heart which I think is really beautiful and because the heart hieroglyph is represented by this kind of pot or jug like vessel you get a real experience you get a real feeling for um, how ancient Egyptians experienced a heart feeling, like a love feeling or a bliss feeling, because they talked about 
the drunkenness of the heart and the heart vessel overflowing with feeling, which I think is really beautiful. Mm. Um, so yeah, you have, uh, uniliterals, biliterals and triliterals. So they represent phonetic values. And then you have what's called a uh, determinative, which refers to the actual thing that it is. So for example, the ancient Egyptian word for cat is mew. And uh, Mew is represented by a milk jug in a basket and a quail chick. And so they're the phonetic elements to it. And then the determinative is the picture of an actual cat. So it's an onomatopoeic word because it's the sound that cat makes. Mew. And then uh, that's how you read it. And you read them. Uh, you read them into the direction that the characters are facing, the humans and the animals. So you read into their faces so they can go left to right, right to left, and they can go up to down as well. But it's amazing once, I mean, I haven't learned hieroglyphs by any stretch of the imagination, but I've started to, and even now going to places like the British Museum, it's like I've opened up a different world of perceptual understanding of it because suddenly it's it's like if you learn a foreign language and in previous years you've gone to Spain and, and it's just been like a babbling in the background. Suddenly you can hear conversations and your your perception changes because of that. Yeah, because that's when when I when I, I learned Greek. And the reason I learned Greek was that I wanted to learn another script. And I used to go to Greece and you know, when you first go to Greece, it's quite disturbing because everything just looks as if you can read it but you can't. I remember once when first time I went to Crete and there was a mate of mine and he turned around one of the instructions, it turned around and it said that um, most signs are actually written. Oh, I said actually again, most signs are either written in Greek or Latin or both. And he turned around to me and he said, well, that's of no bloody use to me. I don't speak Latin either. <laughs> I thought, yes, of course, he's quite right. Cause of course he hadn't realized they were talking about the script rather than the words. But it makes you realise, and just you saying that now, that how, and it was something we touched upon with Richard Grossing, Grossinger last week, you know, that the way we d describe the world and perceive the world is not just the way our language works, but it's the way we write as well. And even the direction we feel, the way time flows and everything, because we write from left to right, whereas, whereas Arabic goes the other way round, even that was changing some way your perception of the world, mustn't it? You know, because it's yeah. just, it's how you structure your life. And again, with English and with written language, I always, when I was at university, I, I did a, talk, a course on the sociology of language. And it's how we don't, we don't read words, do we? We actually recognize the shapes of the whole word. Mm. You know, we don't read it letter by letter anymore. And it's an, it's an acquired skill and every, you know, we all acquire the skill, most of us, they acquire the skill to read and to write. And yet they're so complex and such a wonderful thing, really. You know, the way in which words on a page can evoke images in the brain. Mm. So but then the hieroglyphs even more so because they mm. are graphic representations of concepts and ideas. So you can look at them and you can appreciate them on so many different levels. So you can look at, say, for example, the the um, the hieroglyph of the ibis bird, and you can see the god Thoth, and you can see the word find, and you can speculate and philosophize on the nature of the ibis bird. There's all these different dimensions to that symbol. And, you know, I think this is the thing that's missing from a lot of or has been in the past missing from a lot of kind of historical research is putting yourself in the context of that ancient land and recognizing that, you know, I think that people should know the entire history of a land, all of the plants and all of the animals and all of the birds, all of the creatures that have become extinct, all of the plants that have become extinct, all of the changes to that landscape. There's so many aspects to history that we only really get tiny little nuggets i mean even if you think about pagan religions or traditions that have been destroyed by their successors like how much is missing from the archaeological record is like a million times more than what actually exists you know when christianity came to uh, egypt the the christians were horrible to those practicing the pagan religions you know they killed 
Hypatia of Alexandria. They mm. they murdered uh, everything that they could find to do with that kind of pagan idolatry. So there's so much missing from our knowledge. But I do think that it would be brilliant, like we were saying earlier, if in schools or education places, you just learnt your his- the history of culture that we know so far and we're told that there's probably stuff we don't know about. But actually, if you have if you have a complete overview and a picture, then you can probably make some good guesses and, and have some good ideas about where other things might be found or where interesting places to go might be because you can see how cultures travelled around the world then. Well, for me, you know, I think two of, the, two of the things in the ancient world that really disturbed me, you know, was the murder of Hypatia. Because as I recall, she was murdered by a group of mad monks and they cut her to pieces with um, uh, uh, shells and things, as I recall, you know, which is pretty horrific. And also the destruction of the, the library at Alexandria, you know. And I had, We had a good talk on the Explorers Club about the Library of Alexandria, actually, by James D. Reitfeld. And he was saying there wasn't a kind of cataclysmic event. It just gradually faded out of use there were a few things that happened like there were there was a fire but the fire wasn't completely like all consuming it just generally kind of faded probably with the christianity christianity kind of destroyed that tolerance that had existed in places like alexandria and it's interesting isn't it that monotheism is like least tolerant of religions and yet all these cults and all of these different religious ideas coexisted in Egypt for thousands of years, yeah. relatively harmoniously. But monotheism is something that generally tends to be quite intolerant. Yeah, sadly so. I mean, one of the things that I was thinking when you were discussing there about hier- uh, hieroglyphics is, are, are they are they able to convey abstract ideas as well, you know, in terms yeah. of philosophy? Philosoph- yeah? Okay. yeah, like um, the... Uh, Egyptian word for wise is zia and that's that's represented by uh the a piece of fabric and so you can you can think about what that represents and i i think of it as meaning that being wise is having that overview and that understanding that reality weaves together and um to understand a small part of it is the ability to understand the whole of of things. It's like a, a fragment of reality. Wow, fascinating. Because this is one of the things that, you know, when you, you start to go into looking into the, the heritage of words and the backgrounds of words and the subtlety of how words, even within, within Latin and Greek, work together to convey ideas. Um, and this moves us on quite nicely, I think, to our mutual interest in the interface between Greeks, uh, between ancient Egyptian society and um, the Minoan society, or the people that call themselves the Keftui, but effectively we know them as the Minoans because Arthur Evans decided that it was to do with King Minos. And there was something that um, I only discovered recently was a direct link between the two, and probably you're aware of it, I didn't realise that there was a labyrinth built about 1800 BCE at Medinet al Fayum under mm. Amenhet the third of the 12th dynasty. So that's interesting, isn't it? So the concept of the labyrinth was already within Egyptian society. I think that's how a lot of necropolises would represent themselves, though, as like underground cities and worlds. Like at Saqqara, the extent of the necropolis there is is vast, and it's basically an underworld that's been created for a uh, continuation of life in the underworld. Because this is interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about the necropoli, I suppose, you, the, the correct term? No, I, I wasn't quite sure how to say that. I mean, there's, yeah. there's loads of it that still hasn't been discovered, but it's this, one of the sort of richest sources of archaeology because it was used consistently throughout ancient Egyptian history. There were always people being buried there. It was always a site of um, religious importance. Right, yes, because one of the... um, It just reminds me as an aside, really, about, for no apparent reason, I just remembered something, though, we were discussing whether it's... um, 
what the plural is. There was a very famous incident. Well, it's not famous at all. It was a friend of mine who worked there who was telling me. But in the 1970s, he was working at London Zoo. And apparently there were a series of letters that were sent to London Zoo. And the first letter came and it said, um, Dear Sir, please send us two mongooses. And they got two <laughs> mongooses and said, Please, sir, please send us two mongoose. And they crossed that out. And they said, dear sir, please send us to Mongai. <laughs> and then the, the, eventual, the eventual letter that was sent, how they got around it, they said, dear sir, please send us a mongoose. P.S. Please send us another one. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just love that. And apparently it's mongooses. So if you are interested, guys, it's mongooses. Um, I just, just reminded them about, I mean, it, we need levity here, but it was just, we're talking about death and, 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 and necropolis and necropoli, and that leap to mind shows my weird mind, really, I suppose. But one thing that has fascinated me is, is the cross-fertilisation of ideas between the, the ancient Egyptians and the, the Minoans, um, have you any thoughts on that? Because we can have a really interesting discussion now about Oh, yeah, that. that's one of my absolute favourite things to think and talk about it. I mean, how can we know? But I think essentially all of those ideas came from the Near East. And uh, because the Minoans, there was already an established seafaring culture on the Cycladic Islands. And there was already trade between the Indus Valley and the Near East in Mesopotamia specifically and so through trading i think the those that the bronze age development in crete was a result of migration and travel from indus valley and the near east and actually there's been some evidence to put forward the idea that maybe minoans were visited by people from the indus valley because of that incredible developments in irrigation and sanitation and water treatment because they've got very similar systems of flushing toilets uh springs feeding fountains like really complicated waterworks because yeah, it's one of the things that again it, it's cultural relativism but when when i traveled in northern india a few years ago i was astounded at the culture and the architecture and the history and the prehistory of that area, you know, and clearly, because that thought, when I first went to um, Knossos way back in the late 1970s, it intrigued me because I thought it felt very different in so many ways as if they'd come from somewhere else. And because physiologically they seem to be smaller and more elegant, more like they would be people from the Indus Valley, maybe, mm. and they'd moved across. Um, and clearly the, the people like Arthur Evans were trying to very much place them within the overall Greek world, whereas there's a counter argument to say it wasn't the Greek world that they were necessarily relating to because they were had great antipathy with the, with the Athenians, so there wasn't any real relationship there. Yeah, there's uh, so much found in Manoa that relates to Egypt and the Near East and there are scarabs found, there are um, cylinder seals and seals and the irrigation systems were the most sophisticated in the Greek world. The Cycladic cultures came first and they were making goddess figurines from what mm. I can gather and they were good seafarers as well and I think this is the thing actually like the Near East uh, Manoa seems to be really influenced by places like Anatolia, Mesopotamia, Indus Valley, and then Le like Egypt as well around the same time. But there's loads of trade between Manoa and even pre-dynastic Egypt. It already existed. And the Egyptians weren't great seafarers, as I learned yesterday, but the Minoans were excellent seafarers. You know, it really was a, a kingdom built upon seafaring. And Minos was, I think, the first king to institute a navy. And actually, there's a, a theory that I find very interesting that in terms of the Indus Valley connection, that uh, the Vedic root Mino means judge and leader, which Minos is from. And it could have actually been a kind of root to denote kingship in general in that region, because you've got Menes as being recognized as the first king of ancient Egypt that united um, upper and lower Egypt as well. That indeed is intriguing, isn't it? 
um, because one of the things that way, way back, um, many, many years ago, I acquired this book, which I've read many, many times called The Secret of Crete by a guy called um, Hans-Jörg Wunderlich. And Wunderlich was um, a fascinating guy, but by trade he, or by training, he was a geologist rather than an, an archaeologist. But his argument is a very interesting one. And it's funny enough, I was watching a, vi a video a few weeks ago, which was a, a lecture at Oxford University by an expert on Minoan civilization describing Arthur Evans and his excavations at Knossos in, in 1900 and everything else onwards. And he mentions a series of books that have been written about the Minoan civilization and completely excludes Wunderlich, doesn't mention him in any shape or form. And Wunderlich's argument is a fascinating one because it links directly to the influence of Egypt, because he argues that the it's a necropolis, that Knossos is a necropolis. It is not a place where people lived. And if you look at it, and when you go round physically round the place, and I've been to Knossos about four or five times now, you see evidence of this everywhere. Like for instance- yeah, It doesn't feel like, well, the thing is the palace thing, everything, nearly everything we know about Manoa is influenced by Arthur Evans, who was just making it up. <laughs> really, mm. he, he had an idea yeah, of yeah. the narrative that he wanted and he, created half of the stuff that we see now and take to be genuine artifacts like even the snake goddess is a reconstruction and um, there are goddesses that have snakes on them but that one that you see he found bits mm -hmm. of that and put that together in the vision that he had of it he placed a cat on its head and everything um and the original notes from the dig there say that the goddess was holding flax not even holding snakes so Wow. And even he was working with um, two archaeological artists. They're both called Emile Gilleron, their uh, father and son team. And they were artists and they totally um, kind of art nouveau the repainting of the frescoes. So I think, you know, you see in Minoan art a certain kind of, say, like, like you were talking about finer features, a certain kind of Minoan artistry that's distinctive. But they... They have, I mean, Arthur Evans moved stuff around to create scenes at mm -hmm. Knossos. And when you go there, you see that stuff has been kind of organised in the way that uh, Arthur Evans had the vision of what he thought it looked like. I mean, it's a really unusual site because of Arthur Evans. You don't really get ruins that look like Knossos for anywhere no, else. And it was quite a shock <laughs> the first time I went. I thought, well, God, this is like Disneyland. You I know, love you it. Look at <laughs> yeah, when you look at, for instance, like La Parisienne, you know, the, 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 the wall painting of the, 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 the lady with the big eyes, you know, this was more um, 19, late 19th century Paris than it was anything to do with the... Totally, Indian yeah, Indian they're like Art nouveau up. Yeah, and, and the th I didn't know that about the snake goddess. I mean, so that, that reminds me in many ways of the classic example of how you can get things wrong. Like, for instance, if you go down to Crystal Palace um, and you see the dinosaurs in Crystal Palace... That there are there are there in the garden. The iguanodon, on all fours. Yeah, the iguanodon, and of course, what happened was, and you you are obviously aware of this, is that when they found the iguanodon, which was literally within about half a mile of where I'm now sitting in Tilgate Park, um, they they found the horn, um, and they assumed it was like a like a typical rhinoceros, and they put the horn on the end of its nose and made it a bipe, uh, a quadruped like a big cow with a horn. And in fact, the horn was was on the arms. It was like a, a Tyrannosaurus in shape, and it was the end of thorns were on the hands. Yeah. And I just wonder, with Arthur Evans, it's the same kind of thing, because if you look at an awful lot of the wall paintings there, 90% of them are recreated, you know, so they're yeah. not part of the whole. And then you look, for instance, at his interpretation of the Queen's bathroom. You know mm. that bath that she has? Mm. Apparently, there's no real drainage to it. It could have been something they washed corpses with. And yeah. more importantly, there's nowhere on the site, and I stand corrected on this because I don't know whether it's necessary to need to go back there, but there's no kitchens of any size anywhere in the huge, supposed, incredibly relaxed, wonderful world of Minoan civilization where they were leaping over bulls and they were doing all these wonderful things. It seems that he became so preoccupied with the legend of Minos and um, Parsifay and her coupling with the bull and
the, 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 the Minotaur and everything else and the death of his son who goes up to Athens and everything else as well. They were creating from a myth what they wanted it to be. And they lost a huge opportunity. You just wonder how much, if Schliemann had done it, say Schliemann had managed, you know, just to explain to the listeners, Arthur, uh, uh, um, Heinrich Schliemann was the guy that did Troy. And if, if he'd done it in the systematic way that Schliemann did it, because Schliemann apparently was trying to buy the land and failed because the Turks wouldn't negotiate with him or tried to twist him around. So Evans had the money and bought the land and then managed... In 1895, he bought the land. Then by 1900, he was, a, he was able to do his work. He imposed so much upon it and so much was lost. And as other people have said, you know, you go down to Ayatriada in the south near Matala, you see how it would have been if he not got carried away. But you have to yeah. say that there is a magical feeling about it, though. Yeah, I you do. Know, the, the I do love Mitos. I think it's gorgeous. I think that um, one of the... One of the fascinating things to me is a Festos disc as well. And I've just yeah. I've been doing some research on that recently because I was I saw the TED talk where there's talk about um being able to translate the text on the Festos disc. That's linear linear A, isn't it? It's linear A, the Festos disc. I thought a. it was like proto linear A because it's oh, right. hieroglyphs. Okay. Okay. Uh, I might be wrong on oh, that. Because they are yeah, because they are hieroglyphs, aren't they? Yes, yes, yeah. that's true. Interesting and point. um uh, one of the recent uh, translation attempts has been done by computer scientists and it's really interesting. I can't go into all the technical stuff because I don't understand it well enough, but basically they've, um, they've put it to computational science and they think it's actually proto-Hungarian, the language. And oh, wow. that... Um, because Magyar is very, you know, the Hungarian language doesn't have any relative in its kind of neighbouring countries and is closer to Turkish than anywhere else, mm. which would be yes. very interesting in terms of Minoan influence from Anatolia and Turkey. So it could be a, a hieroglyphic script emanating from Anatolia, potentially. Uh, and out of this, out of this study, they've, they think it's a, a hymn to the sun, the solar goddess. Interesting, because that could make links then to Katal Hayuk in yeah. Turkey, which is the oldest known city. So if it's Hungarian, because, you know, one of the great mysteries, isn't it, is the Hungaric languages, you know, the Hungarian and vaguely Finnish, I think, yeah. are, are similar. But, of course, Hungary, Hungarian doesn't fit in. But if it's a Turkic language, that that is really intriguing. That that really opens up an awful lot of interesting areas, doesn't it? Do you want it? me to read you the um, the hymn? Go on, please. Yeah, Chief God of all, our ruler, Chief God, you protect all of us. Come, light spring, shine again, shine warm and glorious rays. Light up strong, our ruler, shine warm and glorious ways. For our hot cover to rise, we pray. Sunlight, our dear ancestor mother, help our ships sailing on the seas and all of us. And this is part of the Phaistos disc. Mm -hmm. That's that's from the Phaistos disc. According to wow. this study, yeah. Wow. So that again suggests, doesn't it, you know, just how they were a, um, a trading nation. Yeah. But because also uh, worshipping a creatrix, a female uh, creator rather than a male creator. Interesting, which is, of course, one of the themes they said was they seems to be very much a female orientated society in many ways. And that would be evidence of that, wouldn't it? You know, the idea. Yeah, I, saw, I saw recently a, um, an object from, I don't think if it's a, it's a Rackleon museum, but one of the museums in Crete anyway, there's a, an image of the goddess, a terracotta image of the goddess, a sculpture where she is on a swing between two posts with, doves perched on top of these two posts and i think the solar goddess i think that the minoans were um worshipped they had a solar cult because their symbols are very similar to solar worship in egypt and the near east and i think that the creatrix goddess ideas came from turkey and anatolia and progressed into greece from there yeah, because you'd have the whole, um, you know, the mother goddess that you have, um, the one with all the breasts uh, mm. that you actually get in, in, in 
the Near East as well. I can't remember, was it Astarte? It's not Astarte, is it? Is it Astarte? Asherah. Um, pardon? Maybe Asherah. Okay, okay. So you th- that would be very intriguing. So in which case, as, as a conversation starter then, in terms of your understanding of, of a Minoan civilization, I keep you have to call them Minoans because that's what Evans called them, um, but the idea of the symbolism of the bull, do you think that's something that Evans created and misinterpreted the twin, the, the kind of bull symbols everywhere? I think the bull worship was obviously in existence because of the bull leaping sport. Um, and actually there are tombs in Egypt from early dynastic tombs that have bull horns embedded in the walls all the way around. So it's something that they could have potentially got from Egypt. And obviously there's bull worship in Egypt as well. Um, but there is this idea that the Minoan bull sign that you see, the horns of consecration that's kind of everywhere, is actually a reflection of the ancient Egyptian or the Egyptian hieroglyph for a uh, mountain, which is mm. the word Jew. And uh, it's the hieroglyph of the horizon and it can be represented as like two mountains or two mountains with the solar disk in the middle of it, in which case it's the Akhet. Um, But one of the things that I think really relates Manoa to Egypt is the posture of adoration really echoes the Egyptian car and um, the car statues you see and the, the hieroglyph for car, which has a a really, um, I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe what car means in English because there perhaps isn't a satisfactory term for it, but I did ever think about it. I wrote it down. What was my idea? It yeah, was like, isn't, 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 there the, isn't there the car, the cooey and the cat, I, I think, with the tripartite parts of the soul in ancient uh, The ancient car, ancient. the bar, the shaft, bar, car, bar. the ack, the... Um, uh, is that all of them? I think that might be all of them. The, but there's, and then there's the name. There's a few different things. But the car, I think, is really interesting. So the car in ancient Egyptian language refers to what I would call um, a person's creative generative force is my best way to describe it, I think, um, because spirit or soul isn't sufficient. And you also have the bar aspect of something beyond the body in Egypt as well. And um, the a lot of the ancient Egyptian goddess figurines are in this perfect car posture of adoration, which I think comes from that. And then interestingly, the word car in Egypt also means bull, which is the most interesting dimension of that, I think. So potentially the what we see as the horns of consecration could represent mountains. And if also the mother worship comes from more ancient mother worship systems, whereby the original mother, Ma, was mother of mountains, that could potentially be a connection there with this mountain worship. And the interesting thing about Crete's development is that in terms of ritual and religious practice, at least, that actually started in these peak sanctuaries in the mountains of Crete, uh, where we don't really understand or know much about what religious activities occurred there, but they were sent, they were uh, centers of pilgrimage and of um, making votive offerings, at least, which would suggest they were going to some sort of divinity to seek help of some sort. Like in, we see in the Asclepians later on as well, those votive limbs, for example, or votive body parts that are left in order to receive a healing from the God or are left as a receipt for a healing received. That there's so much from that, that you were talking about, you know, really little light bulbs going on and off in my head because the whole kind of twin peak symbolism is something that really intrigues me. You know, the, the idea of that the, the weren't necessarily bull's horns, but twin peaks, because there is a, a twin peak quite nearby to Knossos. And, and more importantly, and it dovetails into the next section of our discussion, the twin peaks that, that, that overlook um, uh, 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 
Eleutheus, 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 you know, the, the Eleusian mysteries. And it seems to be there is kind of a link there with, with the, the, the labyrinth as well. But before we move on to that, can you tell us a little bit about your interpretation of the labyrinth in terms of how it then developed within Minoan civilization and what it really symbolized rather than the, the, the general idea of um, Ariadne and the, the helping Theseus go through the, 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 um, the, the finding his way through the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur. Do you think there's more to that? And if there is, what do you think it is? Uh, I don't. I suppose I wonder about the traditions in Egypt in terms of creating these underworlds, and that perhaps it was just an attempt to create an underworld to create a uh, a developed underworld space to inhabit upon death, because there is the concept in ancient Greek culture of when you die, you go into the underworld, and um, Perhaps it was, you know, like in Saqqara, for example, the necropolis there, it has streets and it has rooms. It has, you know, it's incredibly complex. It basically is an underground city that's been built on over time, over and over again. It, there was an attempt to literally create the underworld. Mm. Yeah. So the more we dig into this, the more excited I become about our plan to try and recreate Plato's cave in Greece next year. Mm. But can, moving on from that, then, um, I've talked about it a lot, but can you, your impressions of our amazing event at, um, at uh, Dracolo in April last year, what did you make of it all? And, and from your point of view, except for it being bloody cold and the was, hotel being a bit... It was bloody faulty. cold and it was hilariously funny. And, um, I mean, the nuclear bunker aspect of it was just incredible it's such a weird um apocalyptic feeling space isn't it and you almost feel like you're entering a history that thankfully didn't happen in in a way like all of the remnants of that potential are still there with the kind of computers and the machineries and the hospital beds and all this kind of stuff that are left behind it had a real kind of eerie feel to it and, That's an excellent uh, point. I've not said, thought about that before. Yeah, it almost was presenting us with an alternate history of what could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's there's something fascinating and innately human about occupying those spaces that go underground. Like we were talking um, a while back about this idea that springs and caves, they lead you into the underworld. And so the attempts to create that underworld probably came from those earlier ideas of caves and springs being portals to the underworld. I mean, and that's what I was going to say about those peak sanctuaries. They're, they're kind of perhaps proto necropolis. They're probably an attempt to commune with underworld or chthonic deities of some sort, I would have thought. But, um, but yeah, it was, really amazing to see what a difference it makes just to go into those kinds of spaces, those underground spaces where time slows down a bit. You don't have access to the normal kind of pointers that would show you where you are. I mean, I felt sorry for Sam because didn't she get lost at one point in deep in well, the tunnel? We, we, we lost her. I think, <laughs> she was, yeah. <laughs> I think like that would give the real experience of what it would be like to be on a, a mystery initiation to actually get lost in tunnels like that and wonder where you were. were. I know, because the thing is, just to um, anybody watching or listening, I mean, if you read read up about the Dracolo Caves, they, they're quite fascinating. And I did some research into the background of the Dracolo Caves before the event, and I discovered that the first, I think it's probably the first description of zombies took place in Dracolo village um, in about the 12th century, where apparently a group of people dug themselves out of a grave and started walking down the high street. So already the place has this intense feeling of strangeness. Then you have the word Dracolo, which is Dragon's Hill in Anglo-Saxon. And so there was this dragon, but the dragons in Anglo-Saxon law were kind of more spirits of protection. They weren't a dragon in the way of Game of Thrones. They were much more visceral than this. So clearly this whole place had had this strange reputation way before they decided to build the shadow factory 
1938-1939 when Rover Cars was the government came in and they they made all these and of course they had a whole factory down there they made Spitfire wings 6,000 people worked down there and nobody knew they were there it's extraordinary strange but and it's just an opening in a hillside but I noticed around the edges of the hillside you know there were magic mushrooms growing so we had that kind of feeling of a link there with the whole Persephone Demeter myth you know, and the idea of Kaikion and, and everything else. And when Steve Steve took me round, um, Matt, and Steve, Matt and I were taken round by Steve um, a few weeks before just to suss it out, to plan it out as to where we were going to go. And there were just the three of us down there, at least when we had the larger group, there were more people. But there were just the three of us wandering around there. And Steve was telling me about the um the manifestations he'd witnessed down there and you heard about the coke the pepsi can thing did you hear that Mark? no oh so, you, it, it was one of the places where that where the, where they used to give the, where the food was where we had the food um it was one of the entrances um steve was explaining to me and i videoed this as well i have a video of it somewhere steve was telling me when he was down there he was doing a guided tour and they were walking around and suddenly they felt there were sounds around them, like poltergeist activity. And Steve said that he picked up an empty can of Pepsi. And you know the way it's like a gridiron in there. There are these wide corridors that run off into the distance and into the cold. You know, there's five miles of these bloody things down there and you can get lost. And they're incredibly dangerous if you don't know where you're going. But we were at this junction of two sides like that. And Steve said he was standing there and he said, OK, if you're out there, I'm going to throw the can into the darkness and throw it back at me. So he, he told me he threw it into the darkness and he heard it bounce in the darkness and then it bounced over here. And it teleported from one location to the other. And the can was was at right angles to it down another corridor. And he said that that was incredibly disturbing because it showed that there was something tangible down there and then he gets his phone out and he said look at this and again i've i filmed the picture on his phone but i'm not allowed to use it because another group are you are working on the research and he pointed in the direction so that photograph was taken looking in that direction and it was looking down one of the corridors and you can see this star being it's the only thing i can describe it's a human shape it's got green light around it and inside it are stars and it's just standing there. And he said, and it was just there. And I'm going, whoa, this is just extraordinary. So we have this kind of real power of that place that I think we sensed when we were there. You know, you just felt disorientated somehow. And there was probably, like a, you, geo, probably a geomagnetic anomaly at Drake, I would imagine, especially if it uh, was called Dragon Mound, because that would relate to um geomancy all right so when your little group when you were doing your experiments there because i because i was the master of ceremonies wandering around in my purple robe i didn't really get freezing cold in that purple robe by the way i didn't get the chance to know exactly what you were doing with is it the seventh wave the thing that you work seventh with ray. so um with Can you explain uh, that yeah so with my very good friend Carl H. Smith, who is the head of learning technologies at Ravensbourne University. And um, we have uh, other people in the team as well. We've got Matteo and Jose and uh, Pablo. And we created this mixed reality, virtual reality, mystery initiation, right? Which we, um, we kind of conceived of after going to... Uh, Atlantis books in London next to the British Museum and we watched Irving Finkel give a talk about the royal game of Ur and we were th we were just inspired to create something that um you froze then for we lost oh, about 30 seconds where did I get to uh you you were saying about Atlantis books Oh, yes, we went to Atlantis Books and we saw Irving Finkel, the curator, the head of the Mesopotamian department in the British Museum. Where is Atlantis Books? On Museum Street, opposite the British Museum. Oh, OK. OK, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so Irving Finkel was giving a talk there about the Royal Game of Ur. And 
me and Carl were just inspired to create something that would give people a tangible, visceral experience of a mystery initiation, right? Which, you know, would be, in an ideal situation, we would open a temple somewhere on a Greek island, I think. But uh, as Carl works with learning technologies and virtual reality is somewhat more accessible for us at the moment, um, we went for a mystery initiation, right, that you could go through using virtual reality. So... We try to take out some of the essential aspects of of those kind of rights and incorporate them into uh, a virtual initiation. Okay, sorry, yeah, uh, sorry, WhatsApp popped up for some reason. <laughs> so, what when when they're using the virtual reality headsets? What do they see? What do they see when they can't they're... tell you because it's a secret, and that's oh, part okay. of the mysteries that I would have to kill you if I told oh, you. I don't want that. I don't <laughs> know. So this was so this was intriguing, wasn't it? So what we were doing, we were taking people and we were putting them into this disassociated state anyway with the the virtual reality headsets. Then we had a handful of, we had Dr. Prokel and Winkler with us with the Lucid Light devices. So we put them into using Lucia's. So we put them into an altered state using flickering, flickering light. So by the time Sam and I had received them, they were already in this kind of quasi weird state. And then we take them down. Well, actually what we did was I take them down into the darkness and then out of the darkness, I'm talking and then suddenly Sam appears and she's Persephone coming out of the darkness, explaining she's been in the underworld and been in Hades for, you know, and Hades nicked her and everything else. And her mum's looking for her and everybody's upset. Then, then we take them down into the darkest part of the caves and we recreated Plato's cave there where we found a back wall and we had some wonderful cardboard cutouts <laughs> that I know that Matt and everybody have been working on all night to get the cardboard cutouts. And then we, we did the cardboard cutouts and tried to recreate the Plato's cave event. And it was then that I thought, you know, really, this is a great place to do it. But the real place we need to do it is Greece itself. Um, and as you know, and some of you guys out there will know, I'm fortunate, fortunate enough to have recently acquired a Greek publisher who my UK publisher has negotiated to bring out my latest book in, in, in spring next year, my life after death, the extraordinary science of what I'm telling we die will be coming out in. Now, the central theme of this book is, is Carol the Boatman, Cheating the Ferryman, the idea of what is reality, you know, what is perception, what happens at the point of death. And I'm particularly intrigued by the ancient Greek myths of drinking the waters of the Lethe, the river of forgetting, the old way it ties in with the Eleusian mysteries. And of course, we then discover that Plato himself was part of the mystery cults himself. And then quite by chance, I find a paper from 1905 written by an American academic who'd spent time trying to find where Plato would have based the cave upon. And it's in there. So we know it's the cave of Vari, which is just outside Athens. And my Greek publisher tells me we can get access to it. So we're in this incredible position that the Austrians could come down from Austria, bring Lucia's with them. You and Carl could bring the seventh way with you and and everything else as well and we can get in that cave and recreate plato's cave in plato's cave you know what i think that's, i think that that's that's an aspect that's missing from these modern facsimiles of uh ritual and the sense of the sacred is the location the sort of magic of the location is missing one of my recent interviews has was was uh, Mervat Nasser Dr Mervat Nasser who is a psychiatrist and a kind of um oh she's just an in absolutely incredible woman she worked as a psychiatrist in London for 30 years she's Egyptian and then she she's a hermeticist essentially and she decided after 30 years working as a psychiatrist in London to move back to Egypt and create the kind of perfect center to celebrate hermeticism and she built from scratch this extraordinary sanctuary eco lodge using traditional building techniques inspired by the architecture and archaeology of the uh, uh, Minya which is where she is so she's in like middle Egypt just off the Nile on the edge of the desert 
and she's constructed these lodges that are stone built. They were built by stonemasons in Egypt that are one of, I think, the last family practicing this art in Egypt. So they're beautifully constructed. They're like pointed domes. And then she's built um, a beautiful pool to grow the sacred water lily, the blue water lily. And uh, it's it's very, very close to the original site of Hermopolis. So it's dedicated to the wisdom of Thoth and Hermes. And that is the kind of thing we need to be doing. It's difficult to get yourself in the right kind of state of anticipation being above a shop somewhere in Bristol, do you know what I mean? Being, trying to do these things somewhere where there isn't the sacredness of the site, where there isn't the kind of magic of the environment and ha having that direct contact with nature and having that care and attention put into how you build even, you know, Steiner was great at that in places mm -hmm. where, you know, Steiner built the Gothanium, like that's one of the most extraordinary building projects ever, I think. And it was conceived as the perfect expression of his uh, philosophy and his spiritual science. Where did Steiner build that then? It's, that's new. Well, to uh, is it Basil? I think it might be Basil. It's, it's, really? uh, and then it burned down and was rebuilt, but out of concrete when it was rebuilt. And so it's kind of magic powers were diminished somewhat. Well, it's interesting, again, with the, the whole um, ethos of the mystery schools and everything else as well, because somebody that um, has come into my group effectively um, is a lady called Victoria G G G G G G and she studied with um, the wife of Manly Hall, you know, that wrote The Secret, Secret of the Ages and various other esoteric books and she's very intrigued with what we're doing in terms of this because we're kind of recreating something extraordinary here and i just feel in many ways and i don't know if you'd agree with me on this but i think we're almost being led to this i i sometimes feel that you know we are we're being pointed in this direction and we have no choice in the matter this is going to happen because it's pointing us there and everything is telling us you know things are being put in place for us to create this really magical environment in the location where it could be. And I think your point there is an incredibly powerful one. You need to feel that visceral touching with history, which we almost felt when we were in Dracolo Caves. I have to say the Dracolo Tunnels really did evoke that in me more, I think, than anywhere I've been. But I know the feeling I get in Greece, like a few years ago, I took myself up to the, the cave that um, St. John of Patmos wrote the Apocalypse. And I made sure I was there when there weren't people there. And you go into that cave and maybe it is just your, the way you think. You're expecting it and you're anticipating, but that's the power of it, isn't it? It is the anticipation that brings about. So for me to turn around and say, well, I was expecting that because it was, you know, we don't know that St. John really did do it there. But I felt, that there was something magical about this place. And you always assume, don't you, these places become magical because please, people could choose lots of locations. They choose these for a reason. There's something about the Telluric forces maybe that just make them something or the Chthonic, as you yeah, say. I think you know. that there was a sensitivity to geomagnetic forces in the ancient world that perhaps we've lost that sensitivity to. And if you look at temple building in ancient Egypt, it said that those temple sites were chosen because they attracted a certain kind of life. They either attracted or were, um, or so for example, if temples are dedicated to a particular animal, it would be because a lot of animals of that type lived on that site before that temple was constructed. So the idea of building and feng shui and uh, harmoniousness was important, you know, that, uh, ancient people constructed culture or after observation of nature and in adoration of natural forces to kind of um, adore it on site. Mm. And I think if we can bottle that in some way, the issue is going to be, I know, I know the location of the cave because I've, I've been, I went there a few years ago, not the cave itself, but in that area. And I think our challenge is going to be to try and isolate it from the, the overall ambience around it, because, you mm. know, Greece can be quite noisy and chaotic. But effectively, my publi publisher, Yanis, 
uh, you know, he he knows a lot of people. He knows the Minister of Tourism, for instance. So we have some quite influential people. And I know with um, Carl's partner, Lena, as well, and I know that she knows a lot of people that can maybe pull strings in order for us to allow us to happen. And with Greece wanting to restart its tourism again, this is something that I know that we could get an awful lot of coverage on. Greek television will bite their hand off for it because it's something they're going to be really intrigued on. Um, also, with the, my book seems to be selling okay in Greece, the first, the, my latest book. So clearly my name is, is, is getting out there. And the idea is that we, we could recreate that there. And then I'm thinking, you know, you and I know of numerous locations that we both know of in Greece that we think... I we really think get my... My sort of bliss place is Santorini, uh, mm. like in the springtime before all the tourist hordes turn up, there's something just yeah. so energising about Santorini. And I think it is because it's a volcanic site and volcanic sites tend to have this kind of like energising feel about them. It's quite frustrating that when you mentioned Atlantis Books, because I thought, oh, did you mean Atlantis Books on Santorini? Because um, one of the intentions for the book launch was to have three locations and the third location for the book launch was going to be at Atlantis Books in in Thera. Um, but unfortunately that bookshop is suffering at the moment quite badly because the amount of people are now going to Santorini is, is, is bad. Now I've been to Santorini as you have out of season and it's a totally different feeling. You know, when you're on the edge of the caldera, you can actually feel what it must have been like. And of course, the Minoan presence there was quite noticeable. And I think that the, the, the site uh, in, on, in, in, uh, in Thera is, is an incredible site there, you know, in terms of the Minoan site there. And I really, subscribe you know, yeah. to the uh, Minoa being Atlantis theory because mm. that culture was so beautiful, centered around the ball, like the most beautiful architecture and irrigation systems. And I think that they probably did inspire. And also the scope and the range of Manoa, we don't really know because of the eruption. So, Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, the timing is correct. Um, clearly, the, the blast would have hit northern Crete cataclysmically. So clearly there is that. The only major problem is Plato turning around saying it was beyond the, tower, the, power, the pillars of Hercules. But effectively, you know, we're not going to hang on. You know, this is a memory of a civilization that disappeared. So clearly, you know, I think that makes a lot of rational sense to me. The interesting thing is that Wunderlich argues that um, the cataclysm argument or the earthquake argument doesn't hold true because he he said he found evidence of of burning within the, the precincts of the, the of Knossos, which suggests that they'd also been attacked. Um, now, of course, it is quite strange, isn't it? That, that doesn't see, it wasn't a defendable location which was odd. So they seem to not have any really great enemies. They had the double axe as a symbol. Um, the lab, lab uh, the, 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 the uh, labyrinth. Yeah. That, that, that was their symbol, but they, apparently the types that they found there were obviously symbolic rather than anything. But the curious thing that I find, and it probably is we're getting towards the end now, I, I'm really intrigued in, and it's only something I've discovered re recently rereading Vondelik is that unlike other ancient cities um Knossos is unique in the sense that its main entrance is in the west and its back entrance is in the east which is completely the opposite unless it was a necropolis and if it was a necropolis that's exactly where they would want to face they want to face west which is the place of death it's the place of the sun dying Whereas other cities, you know, they look look the other way and they want the rising sun and everything else and optimism. And I'm wondering what your interpretation is that the ancient Egyptians, they they used similar. Did they did they put that kind of location for their buildings when it was a necropolis? Well, dying was westing and going west. Yeah. The west region was the land of the dead. So, I mean, they had scarab beetles in in. Um, Manoa. So they were borrowing a lot of ideas from Egypt or the culture influencing Egypt also influenced Manoa. But there was so much trade. I think that's what people don't necessarily, um, we don't, we obviously don't know the extent, we can't know the extent of trade, but trade was huge. Like Minoans were amazing um, seafarers. Their entire culture is built upon trade, commerce, seafaring. They were trading like olive oil to Egypt. Um, 
There were there was a trend even for Minoan pithoi in in mm. dynastic Egypt and even earlier. So they were great at producing things and great at exporting and importing. And also the Indus Valley. I think the Indus Valley boats are the earliest examples of sea going vessels, reed boats that they found. Um, the Indus Valley were amazing seafarers and uh, Mesopotamians were building boats as well. So there was a lot of trade and mutual influence going on, even in very early times. And there's just so many parallels between Minoan ideas about um, life and death. Mm. That it may be, um, you know, developed its own particular culture, kind of all centred around goddess worship as well. I mean, I think I was telling you yesterday, wasn't I? I've, I've been reading this book called uh, Paradise Papers by Merlin Stone. And one of the ideas she puts forward in that is that um, very ancient tribal people or very ancient small groups of people didn't connect the idea of sex with uh, producing children for a while at least. And apparently there are some anthropologists that say there are tribal cultures even now that don't make that connection. And I think some like the Trobriand Islanders, I think were a case in point. There may, there's, I'm sure there's others, but to me, it's not a completely ridiculous idea because after sex, it's like a nine month gestation mm -hmm. period. So it'd be very easy to not make that connection. But once you started to develop agriculture, settle, plant seeds, stay in the same place for a long time, experience groups of very different looking people coming into your location and impregnating your women, you would see that the seed from the male also has a role to play. So perhaps goddess worship did come from this idea that women were seen to be the only ones to spontaneously produce life and okay, then okay, nourish okay. life by breastfeeding and seem to be this like extraordinary nourishing giver of life, which you could Put across the whole of existence from you know the ancient goddesses of the near east anatolia mesopotamia they were queens of heaven and then the gaia idea comes in later but almost every every um dimension of reality has a goddess because it is a generative creatrix that creates life in all of its guises well that's intriguing isn't it so the the the, the artemis symbolism Effectively, you know, with the exposed breasts that the, 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 the supposed god, uh, the, 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 the priestesses had in, in Knossos, clearly there's a link there with the, 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 the whole concept of Artemis. Then you have the idea of, and I think it's an excellent point, why would you necessarily make the link? So, because we know within, within Greek culture, there's parthenogenesis all, all the time. The idea, you know, spontaneously just giving birth because it's, you're impregnated by a god, even, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of Zeus was doing it all the time. We then have, but one of the points that you were making though, when you mentioned the pithoi, one of the things that I noticed when I was, when I first went there, and it screams out to me, is the pithoi they have at Knossos are far too big. They're huge. And you couldn't even clean them, let alone, and there's no other exit point for whatever they had in them to come out unless they turned them over, unless they were purely symbolic. And then again, what were they symbolic of? Were they symbolic of, of again, the death cult where you, you put the stuff in but you didn't intend to take it out because it's there as a necropolis for people to nurture and, and feed upon while they're dead, you mm. know? And, and I think, you know, the symbol of the dolphins, the dolphins are all, all over there as well. And dolphins are also a symbol of death and everything else as well. So we have a lot of symbolism here that I think that there's some interesting themes that we could carry through in our own work there. And I think going to Crete, at some stage, like your dream was. So we're now coming around full circle. I think the idea of going to Crete at some stage would be fantastic, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, maybe do an event in the caves at Matala. Yeah, um, we've got the Lesithi Plateau. That's my oh, yeah. uh, dream Lovely. dream spot. And actually there were Asclepia of a sort, maybe a proto-Asclepia type dream healing sanctuary. And that seems to have trickled down into the folklore of Crete, because when you ask people in Crete, they'll tell you there was a sleep temple 
on particular sites. But whether or not they were, uh, you know, Asclepias may have taken over from an earlier healing sanctuary, like the Peak Sanctuaries, probably. That's interesting, isn't it? Because another place I was thinking that would be a, a curious place you probably wouldn't get access to it now because it's so popular would be Spinalonga. Um, mm. You know, which which has I don't know if you've ever been there. That has a really strange the leper to colony. It. The leper colony, you know, that we made famous by the um, the book. Um, but effectively, you know, it's been there for many many years, and it's a very curious place. But this is what Greece does. Greece has this somethingness that no other country I know has. I think it's got this um, ancestral pull. You know, it's it's our it is our culture, it is our memory. And I think that, like you were saying, we're drawn to doing these things now and the ideas are becoming like ever stronger and more clear and, and with more and more clarity is because we're going through this processing of, or this process of uh, remembering. We're remembering our past. Everything's falling into place and everything's making sense because um we're able to have that connection with our ancestors through visiting Greece. Like there's something about Greece when you go there where, where you do feel like, yes, this is right. Uh, because I mean, the last, I went to Crete during lockdown, well in between the two lockdowns actually. Um, and I get this sense just looking at the Greek language and not just the way it looks on the wall, but the, the meanings of the words and the sounds within the Greek language, they appeal to me so much and they, they have this kind of ancient root in them. And if you go to countries where the sort of oldest history doesn't have that connection to our like, mythological past, I feel left wanting when I go to places like that these days. I love, you know, I love that in Greece you can, feel this like emanation of very ancient culture that still lives and still kind of um influences people to this day and it it does like Santorini and Crete and I haven't been to that many of the Cycladic islands but I would just it's just heavenly to me it's like Santorini is like heaven every single day that I was there I just felt in a state of bliss I just think it's the most beautiful place F. Christo ton filiomu. Yeah, it's um, there is, it's the air, it's the atmosphere, it's the light, it's the people. It's the herbs. I love the herbs. The smell oh, of yeah, the thyme, the smell of thyme. Yeah, and I've really got into uh, Greek mountain tea. I drink that all the time now. I love that. It's from the herb sideritis. And it's, uh, I think it means made of iron. Sideron comes from the oh, word yeah. for iron. And it's kind of extremely good blood tonic, good to stop you from getting colds or flu or probably COVID. When I was last time I was in Crete, the woman said that no one's getting COVID here because we all drink mountain tea. Because <laughs> <laughs> one of the places, again, that if you've never been there, is the, a deep Peloponnese. That's really wild in it. You know, down in Maine, it's just so, so wild. You know, it's ancient Sparta. Yeah, and Sparta is a very disappointing town, but you go to places like Mistras uh, and oh, there's just so many wonderful places there are. Sarah, that has been absolutely incredible. You know, over two hours and it seems like it's been two minutes. It's a time violation. <laughs> I can't believe that it? stuff. I cannot believe that stuff about the inner light. We've got to talk about that more because that is like, to me, any timeline episode of um, Star Trek is my favourite, but that is like... Um, a religious experience watching that episode it's just the best mm, uh, yeah i have to agree you know it is extraordinary and i'll be digging more into it in terms of trying to isolate the motivations of the writers and things because i'm planning to have a whole chapter on films movies film um, poetry on cheating the ferryman and the whole idea of living your life again over and over again and, and everything else as well. And there's so many themes there. Again, it's an embarrassment of riches. I've got probably more than one book. It's always the problem I have. But anyway, Sarah, thank you very much for that. Um, My pleasure. Next, next week, we have Dr. Alan Roberts. 
who is a, a really old friend of mine, not old in years. Well, he probably is old in years. He'd be the first to admit it. Who's a really fascinating guy. And that's going to be great fun. Alan is one of these people that can just make me laugh out loud all the time. He's just so funny. Um, great fun. And we'll be looking forward to that. Sarah, thank you very much. Um, was there any activity on, on Facebook? Is everything okay on the Facebook side? Um, there were some questions, actually, but I didn't really get much of a chance to ask. There's someone asking about the Etruscans, but that's like getting into a whole different... A whole um, different world, yeah. A whole different world. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Okay, Sarah, thank you, as always. Thank you very much. And I hope that, you know, gives um, a lot of the people that are starting to watch this on a regular basis an idea of what bees are in our bonnets and what we're planning for the future. Exciting times. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, and we'll see you soon. And uh, I'll see you next week. <laughs> Okay then. Okay. Bye. Bye.